Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Curious Competitor Podcast. I am your host, current New Jersey Devils defenseman, Connor Carrick. We got a big guest today. Uh, he, he's an awesome person on the ice, elite player, uh, elite defenseman in our game. He's an awesome person off the ice, elite teammate, uh, one of the more fun-loving guys I've ever played with, P.K. Subban. He was an NHL All-Star in 2016, 2017, and 2018. He was a Norris Trophy winner in 2013. Uh, he's an Olympic gold medalist in Vancouver, 2010. He's got two World Junior Championships, uh, gold medals to his name. He's got a production company. Uh, he is the host of multiple uh, charitable functions with PK's Blue Line Buddies. He has donated $10 million to the Montreal Children's Hospital. PK's got a lot going on. He's an exciting individual, an exciting player to watch. We have a lot, uh, a lot to unpack today. Let's do this. Do it. All right, Subi. Let's do it, bro. Um, first off, I've had uh, like 52 cups of coffee today. And always, <laughs> always hanging out with you. I'm juiced up. I was FaceTiming with our boy Johnny Hayden today. The oh. Devils posted a link, uh, an Instagram of me and Runes when Runes had that shorty that he uh, took the big clapper and scored. I was open, but I'm feeling the love from... The Devils guys, which is hard, man. It was a, it was a tough season. the The ending was ugly, um, but this is more so today. I want to talk about with you some of the cooler things you've done in in your career. Some of the highlights, because I mean, we've we've you know we shoot the shit over dinner and things like that. But you've you've been through some really cool, whether it's the World Juniors, the Olympics, you've been through the Norris Trophy. Um, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about your personality because of all the, I get asked about you all the time because you know, you, you've built uh, a personality and you are, you are a lovable person on your own. Um, but I get asked all the time, what is PK like? And one of the answers that I'll say is I don't know if I've ever played with someone that has more fun in hockey than this guy. And I, I draw inspiration from that. We're, we're, you know, uh, locker mates you know, in the room. Yeah. And I love sitting next to you because you're always, you're always jammed up. You're always juiced. Where does that stem from? Because I think you are such an energetic leader in every sense of the word. I, I, I haven't seen you yawn yet. You know, we were, we we're on pace to play uh, 82 games and you bring it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, on the ice for sure. You know, and then you are more involved in the average player away from the rink with, you know, your charity functions, your social media presence. Where did that start? Is that something that was always a part of you or is that something you consciously choose to, to be? Well, first of all, I want to give a shout out, Johnny Hayden. You mentioned his name earlier. Sup, I love kid. Hayes. Sup, kid. <laughs> um, sup, Hades. And also, I do want to give a shout out to the Devils. Uh, I don't think I've done this in my career before. Um, but I'm going to give a shout out to the New Jersey Devils for how they've been handling social media because they have made a conscious effort to want to have more of a presence on social. And I think that the way they've engaged the players and fans, um, listen, I look forward to seeing what the Devils post. And, you know, I got a lot of things on my feed, a lot of things going on in social media. So I think that says something. So shout out to both Hades and the Devils. Um, you know what, C's? Uh, let's just talk about life for a second. Um, Chop it up, Because I think that everybody wants to always bunch in Connor Carrick and hockey, P.K. Subban and hockey, John Hayden and hockey, the New Jersey Devils and hockey. But it's like, it's really like we're people first, right? And um, I think that you have to look into where I come from, how I grew up. I mean, first of all, my, my parents you know, we're not born in North America. My parents were born uh, in Jamaica in a small island called Montserrat, close to Antigua. Um, they came over to Canada very, very young. My dad, I think, came over at like eight or nine years old. My mom came around the same time. And my mother lost both of her parents very, very young. So she grew up with her sisters. Um, and, uh, you know, they met and then we had five kids. And that's the thing. I grew up in a household of five kids. I was right smack dab in the middle. So, you know, I, I always 
was kind of on an island kind of all to my own a little bit. I mean, we're a very, very close family, so don't get my words twisted here. We're very close even today. Um, we talk every day. We're very, very close. Um, but my brothers are closer to in age and my sisters are closer in age. So I was kind of in the middle. So that's why everybody always says like, you know, PK is kind of so much different than his brothers. And you know, you've met Malcolm and Jordan. Everybody's, oh, PK is so Great different kids. from Malcolm and Jordan. PK is so uh, different. PK is so different from his, his older sisters. Um, I'm probably closer to my sister, Natasha, than anybody else in my family in terms of personality. And I think that because of that separation in age, I was very close to my family, but I was also very independent. And, you know, hockey was my way of being independent. It was something that I worked at every day and I love to do. But whenever you see me post videos of myself at five, six years old, and you see the birthday videos and all that stuff, it's literally the same person I am today. And that was the frustrating thing throughout my career is people always trying to put me into a box and, you know, trying to you know, portray me a certain way when they don't even know me. Like, you, you know, it's, you know, people want to corner you and because they don't understand you, they're like, we don't understand this guy, but we're, we're going to paint him this way. Cause this is what I think he probably is. This is, this is who I think he is instead of taking the time to actually get to know me. But when we, we get to hockey, I think that it's got to start with the person and with social media and what I've done in terms of phil philanthropic work and charity work, it's all been about kind of what I've grown up around. You know, my family, my dad is a educator for over 35, 36 plus years. Both of my sisters are teachers. My sister's husband's a teacher. Um, you know, my mom raised five kids. So everything I've ever seen with adults is them always trying to help children. So for me, coming through my career and having a platform you know, maybe when I started hockey, I didn't always think about the philanthropic side of it. But, you know, I, I look at World Juniors when I won those two gold medals and it was never about like, oh, PK, you're a good hockey player. It was always, PK, you're an inspiration to my child. PK, you're an inspiration to me. PK, you're an inspiration to my brother. And when you have that, you know, you start to, you start to think a little bit differently. It's not just about the game that goes on the ice. It's like, I also want to respect what fans how they see me and what they expect of me every night and every day and what I stand for. And, um, you know, I, I think that that is shown through some of my work off the ice and how I've carried myself on the social media side. That's just me being myself, man. That's my way of having fun and, um, controlling the narrative to my fans and to people that want to follow me on who I actually am so that they don't have to go and read the media or listen to read some news article on some dude who's never met me before, who thinks he knows me, that wants to write a story about me. If you want to know who I am, just follow me every day. I share enough of my life on social media. You'll get a good, a good dose of that. You know, I, I have some, uh, whenever I try to plan for a conversation and, and mm -hmm. you, you can only control it so much and you don't want to, you want it to be conversation. But one of the things you know, that I wrote down, uh, when I try to reverse engineer, like what I want to highlight about the person. Um, one of the words that comes to mind with you is authentic. And I, I, or I think that you live very much in alignment and, and just doing a, like a little bit of research before our podcast, there was a quote you had like an ESPN art, uh, article and it was all you can do all you continue to do is work on yourself every day as a player and as a person. And that's it. I try to get better every day and continue to do good things, not just for myself, but for the people around me and just create good energy. That's the word we started with around mm -hmm. me, wherever I go, because that's the only way to live in my opinion. And we spend a lot of time together as teammates. And that's when people ask me about PK Subban, I said, he cares deeply about his craft. He loves coming to the rink, getting after it, finds himself a foam roller you know, brags about the beet juice he brought to the rink. He's got his meals going. He's got his, his, his cooler, his Yeti going. Um, he goes out, he practices or plays, and he gets ready to do it again. And then on top is caring about other people and trying to make, using your humility and, you know, you're a superstar in our game, you, using the platform you've built, uh, both through your career and, and your social media presence to make the world a better place. And I think... So much of it stems from 
you, you mentioned how this was just who you were since five or six. Like you're very in tune with who you are, mm-hmm. who you've always been. This was not a switch. This was not a business decision. This was not, right. this was authentically you. And I think that that's, um, that's what I try to explain, you know, in my 30 second answer, when people ask me, what's PK all about? I'm like, man, he's who he is. And I admire him for that. Well, you, you know what, sees I, I, I agree with you in the sense of like, I am who I am, but I also don't want to, I also don't want people to think that it's crazy for them to wonder, you know, to wonder if is, is this really the person that we see on social media? Is this really who he is? Is, is he a nice guy? Is he, you know, what's his deal? And I think that inadvertently sometimes people see so much of me in different ways, right? Whether it's, you know, I I always talk and guys always said this. I remember playing in Montreal. I played six years in Montreal and I remember right around my fourth year, I was at like an event. I think it was an all-star game or something like that. And I was talking amongst a couple players. I can't remember the exact players that I was talking to. And we're talking about how many years we played in the league. And I was like, oh, I've only played four. And guys are like, man, it feels like you've been in the league for like six or seven years because just playing in Canada, playing on that platform, playing in Montreal, especially being one of the more visible players, you're always in the media. You're always on TSN. You're always on Sportsnet. And especially if your quotes aren't cliche quotes, if you speak in your mind, you're going to be out there even more. If you decide to celebrate after every goal like no one's ever celebrated, you're going to be out there even more. You know, And if you happen to look like If you look differently than 95% of the guys in the league, you're probably going to be on TV more. So when I first came in the league, it was just, just, there was a lot of PK. And I think that that can rub people the wrong way too, is, you know what I mean? And and I, I understand that and I get that. That's why I said, all you can focus on is focus on who you are as a person. Can you look at yourself in the mirror? Do you feel that you're doing your greater good for society with someone You are someone that people look up to. Whether you like it or not, you are a role model. I'm watching the Jordan documentary, Last Dance, and he says, if there's one thing I wish is I wish I was never a role model. Because, you know, when you're a role model, it's people put you, it's almost like it's unfair what people expect of you, right? They expect you to be perfect in every way. And it's not that I don't wish that I was ever a role model. I embrace the fact that I'm a role model, but I also embrace the fact that I'm not per- that I'm not perfect. You know, I, I, I'm, and you know this, Seize. I'll be the first to poke fun at myself. I'll be the first to, you know, to to say, hey, listen, it is what it is. I'm going to embrace the mistakes that I'm going to make, but that's the, that's what life's all about. You know, you got to have a zest for life. You got to take it full on. And I think that the people that get the most out of life are the people that are not worried about making mistakes, aren't worried about being perfect. You know, if you're always worried about those things, you can't get the full enjoyment. Well, I think it's so important to give yourself that permission to like Mm. go out and do things in the face of judgment. There's going to be judgment and and you know how uh, traditional the culture of hockey is. And and it's, it's beautiful. It's admirable. It's so team oriented. Uh, It's been that way a long way, uh, you know, for a long time. Um, But, you know, as a player, you know, I feel it. I know you embody it where there are special people in this game. There are special stories and it's, it's our job as players to gift our game to somebody else. It's not like hockey is not like, you know, basketball and soccer where all of a sudden you can just wander over to the park and have a ball and start shooting hoops or kicking the soccer ball around. Like someone as a kid has to put the skates on your feet. Like this game has to be introduced. It's not as organic sometimes as other sports. Um, you know, and I, I'd say you're, one of the leaders in carrying the torch towards trying to definitely one diversify our game. We could talk about that because that's Mm -hmm. something the NHL I know is, is really trying to pay attention to more than ever. Do you, Um, you, but see, do you know what my biggest, what I feel my biggest responsibility is? Because I think some people might look at me and say, you know, what's, what does PK want to accomplish in terms of the game? Forget about on the ice, right? Because we all know that I want to win a Stanley Cup, want to be the best player I can be. We get that, right? There's no question about that. What do you want to accomplish as a person, being one of the black hockey players to come through the league? What, is, what do you want to accomplish? And for me, it's got to be much bigger than myself. It's got to be much bigger than the color of my skin. 
it's got to be much bigger than, than just the interviews of getting in front of things and being in the media once again for people to see you talking. It's got to be about, my opinion, about bringing people together. If it's not about bringing people together, I don't want a part of it, man. I want to bring people together because, you know, I believe there's too many good people in our game. There's things that have to change. I think that on the grassroots level, there's things that got to get better. You know, I mean, my social media feed every day, the stories that I see, the kids that go through things, playing hockey and minor hockey, hearing things, parents, um, you know, it, it's, it's inexcusable. It should not be happening in today's world, but it is still happening and it's got to get changed. Now, what's the right way to go about changing it? We're trying to figure that out, you know, but in the game of hockey, the game of hockey itself, in the NHL, the league that I played in for the past, I've met so many great players, so many great teammates, so many great guys. And I'm so proud of the players and how they've responded through this whole thing, you know, including yourself, Connor. It's not easy for guys to make statements and come out. This is the first time I've ever seen, um, you know, since I've been in the NHL and since I've watched the NHL, players step up during a time where there's human rights things going on in the world. This is about human rights, right? Everything that's been going on. And to see players step up and have a presence and have a voice in the NHL and not wait for somebody to paint a brush or paint them into a corner, for them to see the need to get ahead of it and say, you know what, no, this just isn't right and I gotta say something about it. To see players do that, like for me, is the utmost respect. And I owe those players the respect as well to make sure that my actions reflect that, to reflect their support and reflect the players in the league that wanna see change happen and wanna see our game just get better. Like this is about, this is about the world getting better. This is about people getting better. It's not pointing the finger and talking about what he did or she did. It's not about that. It's about, okay, what are our next steps? How do we get better? How do we, we create a world that you know, embraces equality, embraces, embraces diversity, embraces everyone, right? Black, yellow, purple, brown, good, bad, or indifferent. How do we just embrace everybody and bring people together? And that's my objective, man, is just, I, I want to build bridges in this world. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to build bridges in communities. I want to build bridges in the league. I want to build bridges as, you know, all over the world in our country. Um, I want to build as many as I can so that people feel comfortable to walk in their own shoes, to walk in their own skin and, and to be who they are. Because, you know, I was able to do that. You know, I've been able to walk through my life in my own skin and it's the most rewarding thing ever, you know, just to, to walk out your front door and feel comfortable in who you are. Well, here, so that was one of the reasons that I really wanted to choose to start a podcast, choose to be more vocal about um, my thoughts and beliefs in the world was I wanted to foster a greater sense of togetherness amongst people because I am somebody who deals with anxiety. There are days where you know, I have felt uncomfortable in my own skin. That it's uncomfortable. It's not fun. It's it's hard to have uh, that self doubt or uh, to move you know through the world anxiously. And if I, knowing some of that pain, if I could ease someone else's journey, help them feel more confident, help help them feel more fulfilled and happier, and and who they are as a person, and willing to step out and be that person earlier in their life, right? Exactly. Get past that fear of judgment. That's that's one of the reasons why I looked up to you because I could even because you were in the league long before I ever got there, and uh, you know I always had an appreciation for. I'm like PK Subban isn't out there overthinking. PK Subban isn't out there playing worried about the judgment of the 300 level. You know whatever what anybody has to say. He wants people to to, to like him, but you're not afraid. No. And there were times of timidness in my life. Times of uh, self doubt that if I could speak out about, you know, some of the mental health practices that helped me get through that, if I can, uh, speak out in a way that gives someone else a stronger voice to be themselves earlier in their life. I thought what a gift that could be like, what, why can't I be the leader or the friend in life to someone else that may, maybe I wish I had earlier that allowed me to continue to grow. No, I, I, I completely agree with you, Connor. And I think that that's, it, it is tough. And, you know, right from the start, and let's be honest, 
I had some rough days too, man. Like, yeah. trust me, being myself and especially coming into the league, having that personality wasn't always received well, you know? But the response, my reaction to people's actions towards me, in my opinion, is what allowed me to continue to move forward. And, and my reaction always came from a place of love. <laughs> it always comes from a place of love. It never comes from a place of hate. It never comes from any other place other than a place of love. So, you know, people are always fearful of what they don't understand. And it's also part of my responsibility to allow people to understand me. You know, when I first came into the league, you got to show respect to players that have been there before you, right? Mm -hmm. But w w define respect. Respect is, at the end of the day, there's a game that's got to get played. There's a score that goes up on the scoreboard and dudes get paid to make sure that the scoreboard's in their favor. So I got to go out and do what I can to win. Not everybody's going to like what you do on the ice. But the one thing that I always maintained was my respect, my respect for the game, my respect for my peers, my respect for everybody who had, everybody else who had a job to do. And I think that where I built that confidence though in myself, obviously it's parenting. I got a great family around me, great support system, but I built that mental toughness in the gym. I mean, let's not get this, get it twisted. That confidence that I had to go out on the ice and I still have to go on the ice and do my job is built no other places than the kitchen, the gym, and the bedroom, right? And bedroom, I mean sleeping. So <laughs> getting your rest. But, <laughs> Get it right. Get it on. right. You just quick but, clarification. But no, but to a lot of the kids that are listening, I, I, I be honest with you, when kids are sitting there second guessing themselves or think about, you know, when I get in these moments, I have anxiety. When it's time before a big game, I'm, uh, I'm nervous. I, I, I often think that I've never really been nervous because there's nothing to be nervous about when you're prepared. I never felt that I had to be nervous before a game. I had to be anxious. I think that it's okay to, to it depends where the nervousness comes from. If the nervousness comes from you saying, I have to find a way to execute, that's okay. Cause I think that that's healthy, right? Going out there for a big power play and a big moment of the game. And you're like, I have to execute. But to be nervous about making a mistake is something that's completely different, you know? And I think that the nervousness to make a mistake never crossed my mind because I said, I, I've earned the opportunity to make a mistake. I, I've trained yeah. hard. I put my time in. I've, I've dedicated my life to the game. I, you know, I, I, I've, I've gone through the pain of, you know, the stretches and the training and the cold tubs and the diets. And when guys were going out and drinking at the bar and if I'd stepped out, I was drinking waters and I, I, I did, I paid my dues that way. So, you know, I'm not going to put that extra pressure on myself. That pressure came in, in, in April and in, in May and June when I was in the gym and I have to get up at 5 AM and that's pressure. Like the pressure in the game is like, you've already prepared for that. The easy part now is going out and doing what you love to do and doing it when the whole world is watching. Like to me, that, that should bring more happiness than anything. So that was always my take of it. So it's all about how you shape and mold your mind. So I, you know, I think that people, especially athletes, if you're looking to make changes in your mental makeup, everybody is different and my methods aren't going to work for everyone. But what worked for me was to build mental toughness through my work in the gym and my dedication to my craft. Yeah. Preparation is, I think the best medicine for doubt, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, I remember even being a student, you know, growing up, like I was, I was a good student. Like I was rarely nervous for the test because I knew what mm -hmm. was on it and hockey, like the games played. there's five guys on both sides, pucks the same size. There's going to be a goalie each night. Like it's not mm -hmm. that different. And as long as you're proud of your process, there's nothing that you can't expect. Yeah, as you climb, climb the ranks, like, you know, there's, there's some new challenges that are different at first. You know, I, I remember, uh, for example, the first time I ever played against Crosby, Yeah. right? Like, I, it's like he was a hologram. Like, I thought when I cross-checked, I was going to go right through him. <laughs> like, I thought he was, you know, because he, you'd seen him play so much, you'd seen him win the Cubs, you'd, you know, watch his highlight reel, um, you know, growing up. And then all of a sudden... Like you, you cross check him and you think like something's going to happen. He, he's going to slash it back. Someone's going to 
come fight you. And then it's like, well, it's just part of the game. Like part we're, we're game. playing hockey. He's a, he's another player. He'd be shocked if you didn't. Um, and that was, uh, you know, my sort first of a time big, was like that too. C's. Cause remember my first, remember when I got called up to the NHL, it was in the playoffs. Yep. And first we had Ovechkin. I got called up for two games out of the AHL uh, to play in the NHL back to back against the Flyers. It was in Philly and then at home in Montreal. They sent me back down to the minors, play the first round of the playoffs against Manitoba Moose. Um, had a really good series. We were pumped. We beat them, and I think it was six games. And after the game, we're all celebrating in the room. Uh, you know, um, coach comes in, Guy Boucher comes in, says, You're going up to the big club. It was game six. Uh, game six in Montreal. That was the game where Halak had 75 saves. And then we won yep. that game, played game seven in Wash, beat them in Wash. I remember sitting there with uh, uh, Pyatt, Tom Pyatt, and Ben Maxwell, and all these guys, and we're like looking at each other. We're like, did we just beat the Washington Capitals, Ovechkin? Like, we're eight seated team. We didn't even have a chance. I didn't even have a chance to go get clothes. I had no clothes. We flew to Pittsburgh after the game because it went seven games. Flew to Pittsburgh, and God bless them, but Mike Andler and Jeff Molson opted to give me money because I didn't have any dough at the time. Like, you know, I had nothing really on me to go and get clothes. I ended up going and just buying my own clothes. I was like, it's okay, guys, I got it. I went <laughs> and bought like a suit and then we played Pittsburgh. And I remember that series, like two of our defensemen, Hal Gill got a huge gash on his leg. So he missed the game. Uh, Spot check got sick. And I think Hammerlick also got injured. So we were missing like three of our mainstay defensemen. And... I no, it didn't matter because now they had to play me. So it wasn't like anybody could really put the reins on me. It was kind of like, we got to kind of just put this kid out there and let him go play. And that was my thing is that I, like, I'm seeing Sidney Crosby. Like I remember I skipped my second eyelet in my skates right around my ankle because I saw a sports illustrated magazine of Crosby, yep. like literally jumping over a player and he had his skates tied that way. And I was like, I want to have my skates tied like Sid because Sid's he's fucking sick, right? So I'm yeah. like, I'm like, okay. So I'm playing against Sid and like I'm in a battle with him, but I'm like, this is kind of uncomfortable for me because I'm like, I gotta cross check this guy. I'm being me, I'm being a prick to this dude. And this guy's like one of my favorite players, like in the league. I respect him so much. So I know exactly how you feel when you played against Sid for the first time. It was like all those guys, you know, Sid, Ovechkin, like these players are, they're Hall of Famers. It's part of the process. You know, you, you got to get out of your own way and, and understand that you too, just like they did, you know, prior to you arriving, like you've been putting the work in your whole life too. Yeah. And, and now it's, now it's your time. Let's go down that road. Cause you've played, you know, the world juniors Olympics, you know, you've, you've had some big playoff series in Montreal, uh, a lot of expectations in Nashville. Now we're, you know, in Jersey together, like what are some of your, when you, when you're looking back, cause you're 31 now and hopefully you play till you're 45 and I, let's not even cap it there. Let's go full Chelly. Hopefully you play to 55, right? You take care of the body. You got the tomatoes in between games and yeah. <laughs> six egg omelets in the morning. Uh, I never seen a guy, never seen a guy order six egg omelet till I played with you. Um, but I thought that was, uh, that's fascinating to me that you, that you can pound it that way. But when you look back, what are some of your favorite memories, you know, uh, from being a young pro all the way up till now? Cause you got some, you got to have some great stories. Yeah, man. You know what? Um, well, I'll definitely go back to the start when my pro career started. Um, you know, and I, before I even get to the NHL, cause everybody loves to talk about the NHL, but you know, I always try to make it a point to talk about my AHL days for a lot of the young kids, especially that are listening, because everybody wants to get to the NHL, but it's really the, the, the process of getting there that you, that you worship and you celebrate the most, you know? Um, so true. And I remember coming out of junior and getting to the AHL. I went to training camp and I, I always felt, and you know, my confidence, I felt that I could have played in the NHL at 18, 19. Like I, I, I felt, I felt like all I needed was a couple games of seasoning to just figure out the pace in the game and I would adjust, but you know, the deal it's, it doesn't work that way. And 
I had to go. I remember leaving training camp. I came out of junior, you know, hot prospect, obviously. I finished junior as captain of the all-star team, won two world junior gold medals, went to a Memorial Cup final, you know, went to an OHL final loss, but had some really good years in Belleville. And I just felt I was ready to tackle pro. And I come out of pro and training camp and I don't get the call to stay with the team. They're like, we want you to go to Scotland um, for training camp with the Hamilton Bulldogs. And, you know, that's what we want you to do. And I was just like, damn. And I remember, I think I kind of sprayed my ankle in camp a little bit. So going over there was kind of, it was kind of tough, you know? I mean, out of all places, now I'm going to Scotland. Like I want to play in the NHL. But man, was that year ever one of the best years of my career? I remember going to Scotland. It was a great time. I loved every single one of those guys that I played with. Like that team in Hamilton from Alex Henry, Mike Glumack, Sean Bell, you know, Curtis Sanford, like, you know, everybody, you know, Rusty, I mean, Trots, all these guys that I played with that really took the time to teach me how to be a pro. And that wasn't an easy process, you know, because as a good player and a good junior player, you come out and you think that just being good at what you do is good enough. And it's not, you know, because when you are that good, you have to be a leader. You have to be someone that your teammates can count on. And that year I just, I got better and I got better as every day, every practice, every week went on. And a big part of that was because of the leadership on that team and those guys. So, you know, before I even get to my pro career, I'm not sure my pro career would have been the way it was without me playing 77 games in the AHL, riding the bus, you know, learning how to play snarps at the back of the bus with the guys, you know, just, it was, I missed it. I missed it. And I was really upset when I got called up. I was actually very upset in the playoffs. Um, and, you know, Guy Boucher will tell you that. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go to Montreal because we became, we set goals to become the best team in Hamilton Bulldogs history. We literally broke every single record that year. And Hamilton had some great teams. Memorial Cup winning, uh, uh, sorry, not Memorial Cup. Um, yeah, Calder Cup. Calder, Calder Cup winning teams. and. You know, so just going through that with the guys and our power play and learning how to fit in, you know, Guy Boucher was like a huge power play guy and like just working with the guys to figure out how to beat everyone and how to have that success. And we did that. And then we, now we're getting to the playoffs where it's really time for us to turn it on and for us to take that step. And now you guys are taking it away from me and give me a shot to play in the bigs. And it's like, I didn't finish the chapter here yet. You know, I just felt like I didn't get a chance to finish it. And I got called up and it was a great run. You know, we, obviously we beat Washington, beat Pittsburgh. We ended up losing to Philly in game five. I was actually able to go back to the team. I played a game seven, a game seven or a game six, a living elimination game against Texas. And I, I remember coming down and it was literally one of the easiest AHL games I'd ever played. Like playing in the NHL for a playoff, for three playoff series, and then coming back to the AHL, it was like, I felt like no one could touch me on the ice. And we lost that game. We had some tough bounces, some really tough bounces, and we lost that game close. We should have won the Calder Trophy that year. Um, you know, and so that was the start of it for me. Um, but uh, once my pro career came, I mean, the years in Montreal were what everybody would expect. You know, it was high flying. It was throttled down full way. It was fun. It was laughs. It was a lot of wins, some, a lot of emotion in playoff series. One of the best buildings to ever play in the culture. I'm just, I'm just lucky to be one of the players that was able to play there, be a, be a well-known player and then leave there still being very, very well liked. And I don't take that for granted. That fan base is loyal. Um, I was treated so well there. Jeff Molson, the organization, they gave me the opportunity to, to be the player that I am today. And I owe that organization and that fan base a lot. Um, a lot of fun in Montreal though, man. Great city, a great city to come into as a young guy. Great city to come oh, into. Man. I made a lot of I friends imagine. there. What do you think of Montreal? That the, city? Let's stop at oh, Montreal for a second. What, a, what do you think of Montreal? I like Montreal. 
I like Montreal. We had a, uh, we had a, I remember we had a father's trip uh, game there. Yeah. We were in, uh, first year I made Washington, I was 19 years old. And George McPhee is talking about, you know, it's right in the beginning of the season. And he's like, you know, guys, when do we want to schedule our, our father's trip? And I'm looking around, I'm like, what the hell's a father's trip? It sounds, I mean, self-explanatory, but it sounds awesome. If it's, if, yeah. if I get to bring my dad, like you've met my dad, like he's buzzing. He loves hockey more than anybody. Yep. Um, I'm like, if I get to go on a, an NHL trip with my dad, what a dream. Like I'll, I'll never be able to pay my dad back for all he's done for me. You know, you talk about big Carl and how, you know, influential he was in, in your life. But you know, my dad was my whole world. Uh, you know, definitely the dream in our family gave me permission to think, why not you? So anyway, fast forward, I get, uh, called up a little bit beforehand, but I get to go to on the father's trip, which was in Montreal. I think it was actually in Jersey it was the second game. And we ended up winning in Montreal that night. I think it was five rip, but all of a sudden in the second period, the fans start going nuts, nuts. And this is, you know, probably one of my favorites because I was playing well that night and I didn't figure it out because it, it was like a normal, like one of our guys like cut someone off at the blue line. I don't even remember who kind of a, you know, fluffed shot on net. Um, I think it was Holtz, Brayden Holtby was in net, catches it and the fans go berserk. And I hadn't realized that it was in the second period. There was like four minutes left and they hadn't had a shot yet. So, so the fans were letting the boys know, hey, Thanks for the shot on net. And uh, I was like, man, this is, this is a cool place to play. I want the fans to get mad at us if we're not playing well. I want you them to give what? it to us, you know? See, you're exactly right. And that's what they did for me every night. Like, a lot of people think that, like, a Norris trophy or, you know, a personality is what, what has, gives you fan support or is what gets the fans behind you. Ultimately, like my relationship with that fan base just grew from the fact that like I played every shift like it was my last in that arena yeah. there. I did not take a shift off. I never did. No matter, no matter what happened, no matter what was going on, no matter where the team was. And maybe a lot of that had to do with the fact that I was young and I, you know, I was coming into the league. I wanted to establish myself and I never took anything for granted. I still don't take anything for granted. But I definitely didn't take that arena and that fan base for granted. You know, like that's a special place to play. And I can tell you this, man, on a Tuesday night in the middle of January when it's minus 40 out and it's game whatever it is, game 38, game 40, game 50, whatever it is, and you're like, man, like, you know, we're second in our division. We're okay. This game may or may not matter. It matters there. And you know what? The first two or three minutes of the period when you just walk through it, they're going to let you know. And they let you know. And just like that, you go from zero to 100. And I've seen games in Montreal just like that where we've come back and just steamroll teams just because of the fan base. It's a special place to play. So, you know, very, very cool. But I'll tell you this. Nashville, crazy. Crazy. Nuts. Nuts experience there. That was like a, that was like a sprint. It felt like those three years were just a straight sprint in Nashville. Well, the team was straight so sprint. hungry and so good and so high flying. Like you knew every time you came into Nashville, you're going to have to defend your ass off. Like these guys were going to have the puck coming and they were going to keep it. And you were getting it back until you got it back. Yeah. And you know what? I'm going to tell you this. As good as that team was, the guys were... 10 times better. Like we were good on the ice, but that locker room was one of the best locker rooms I'd ever been in. And this is what I love about New Jersey so much right now is because the guys are great. I mean, guys are awesome. last year is, is frustrating as it was. W listen, we are a close team. We're a pretty close group, man. And we stayed close. That's why we were old able and to young, kinda... old and young all across the lineup. Yeah. It was, it, I, I say the same thing to people. It's not like we were coming to the rink, you know, hunky dory. Hey, we, we, you know, we've lost three in a row. Um, but it was professional. It's a group that wants to get better. It's a group that's studious. Like everyone's looking at their own game. How, how can I get better? They're looking at the team game. What's the team need? Uh, I talked about it with Runes a lot in the podcast. Who's, you know, another shout special, out to K Runes, special teammate. Um, you know, there, there was one story there with Hamilton, and I want to ask about your favorite national one too, but there was one story you told me about. Uh, Guy Boucher's questionnaires. And I think yeah. it's a cool little bit of insight mm. into your 
mental makeup and just <laughs> how you go through pro hockey. Cause it's, it's easy when you care deeply about something, it, it's as much as we do about hockey, it's easy to ride the ups and downs of your career and to get down, you know, you've seen it guys, teammates that squeeze the stick or, you know, things are going off uh, their way. They're off the power play and, you know, they're, you know, starting to throw fit, whatever. But what was, um, tell me the story about Guy Boucher and, and some of the questioners I pulled you aside that one time. Cause I think that's a cool one. That is, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a great story to share. Um, the first thing I'll say is that for a lot of kids listening or players, athletes, you know, the answers are all around you. All the answers in terms of mental and physical, they're, they're out there. The answers are in books. They're in, a lot of them are in the past, right? You got to look at athletes before you, you got to look at people before your time. You got to you have to educate yourself the best way you can at your craft. And that last dance documentary, I've watched it like seven times because I, I want to know every single detail. I want to take everything away from it. And, you know, one thing that I did as my career went on is I just tried to educate myself every step of the way. Like, just be a sponge. You know, I love, I'm a social guy. I love to talk, but I listen I listen just as much as I talk and I try to take in as much as I can. And, you know, I'll give you one thing. Muhammad Ali used to say he was the greatest, right? But he said that he said he was the greatest even before he was right. Because he, you have to believe it before you can actually do it. So, you know, for a lot of people that are like, oh, I want to be the greatest, but it's like, do you believe that you can be the greatest? Like, do you believe that? So it's like, what, People talk about coaches and, and trainers that play head games. Oh, I don't like to play with this coach. He, you know, he plays head games all the time. He's playing head games with me. Well, do you ever play head games with yourself? Like, do you challenge yourself? Like, I challenge myself all the time. I play head games with myself all the time because that's how I stimulate myself. So, for instance, when Guy Boucher, he had a chart in the room and he would have us come in. I think it was, I think it was weekly. I don't know if it was every day. Um, it might've been every day, but every time we had to come in and fill this chart, there was uh, three boxes next to everybody's name. And if you wrote three arrows up, that meant that you felt amazing. If you wrote three arrows down, that meant that you felt like absolute crap. If you had two arrows up, one down, that meant you were feeling pretty good. If you had one arrow down, two up, that meant you were feeling pretty good. If you had two down, one up, I think you guys are getting the picture. But every day I'd come in, I'd have three arrows up. And I was the only player that really had that. So he called me into his office and he's like, you know, PK, why, you know, you always have three arrows up. And he's like, you know, I'm looking right now, you're not, your game's not that great right now. You're not, you know, you're not, you were on the power play, you're not on the power play. And my response was like, you're, you're right. You know, I, I'm, but I'm never satisfied. Even if I was on the power play, even if I was being used the most, I'm never satisfied. But I said, every day I'm excited to come to the rink. Like I have an opportunity to do something that not a lot of people have. So because the game is not good to me right now, because the game isn't good to me because I want it to be, it doesn't mean that I have to change how I feel towards the game. Like what it means is that I got to do more work, but that's fine. I'm okay with the work. The work is a part of the process. So I don't need to change my attitude because of it. It's like people that say, oh man, I got to go to the gym and work, work out now. It's like, well, if that's how you feel, then quit, go do something else. Like that's a part of the job. So, you know, I think for, for Guy and I, that was a, a cool moment because I think a lot of it especially was, was about understanding his players and getting to know his players. And for me, I'm always going to be a positive guy. So, you know, I, I prepare to win. I prepare to perform at my best um, but not everybody's going to always understand my approach, but just know that if you're going to war, you know, I'd like to think that I'm one of the guys that you'd take with you. You're, you're not in denial. You're not, you're not no. lying to yourself. Of course you have tired days, but yeah. the truth of the matter is you and I have been blessed enough to play a sport we love and get paid to do it. 
<laughs> yep. When you boil it down to that, there are no bad days in this game. <laughs> there are none. They're challenging when, days. Challenging days, for sure. It was similar to, um, there's a YouTube clip of Kobe who I, you know, know was an influence on you. We talked about it a little bit when he passed. We are in Ottawa. And uh, where he was discussing about Vince Carter. It was this video about like hard work and, and his mental makeup and a decision that he was making where he's like, Vince Carter was eating the league up. Vince Carter was smacking everybody around and we're going into Toronto and I'm a young pro and my back hurts. And he was like, I just made it. I just decided your back can hurt tomorrow. Your back can hurt on your rest day. But if you don't play tonight, it's going to look like you're dogging Vince Carter, like you're trying to dock him. And I think that there's this, the mind is so powerful. You saw it in the, in the last dance documentary where Jordan, he had a lifetime of history of figuring it out, whatever, whatever it took to win. Uh, and that's what I thought that was something I really wanted to make sure came through in our podcast was it's not like you're totally, you're not in denial. You're not, you're not lying to yourself, but there's an admission that, okay, sure. I'm, I'm struggling, but there's a thought exerciser that occurs to get you to a place of gratitude. You are, in my opinion, you don't talk from a place of have to. You don't have to work out today. You don't have to go to this charity event. You don't have to, um, you know, uh, donate to the Montreal Children's Hospital. You're a get to guy, in my opinion. You get to work out today. You have the privilege to mm -hmm. play this game. And that's where, that's where I think a lot of your energy, you know, if I had to from my side of the fence, that's where I think a lot of it comes from. You're encouraged by the stories that you've learned to tell yourself. You don't let that negative self-talk grow roots in your head. Well, but it's, it's a life approach. It's, yeah. not a, it's not a professional approach. It's a life approach. Like who likes to be around someone that looks for every reason to have an excuse in everything they do, whether it's your relationship whether it's your responsibilities around the house, whether it's your professional career, whether it's your relationship with your family, whatever, like you can come up with every excuse, right? You can come yeah. up with every excuse to say, ah, oh, it's, I don't want to do this or this isn't great or it's this person's fault or it's that person's fault. It's like, no one cares. No one cares. And if you, if you care, you got to care about yourself, right? Like you're only investing in yourself. Yeah. So bring, bring the fun to it, bring the levity to it, bring, bring the excitement to it, you know? And I'm not saying that you're going to be bouncing off the walls every day, but my enjoy what you do. Like one day it's over for us. Sees. It's done. You're going to be working out just to keep in shape. You ain't going to be working out to perform. Right? So if you can't love working out today, if you can't love getting ready to perform at your best, to be the best version of yourself today, how are, how are you gonna be able to do that when the cameras are off, right? When nobody's watching, when nobody's testing your body fat. Like you wanna, it's a lifestyle. That accountability is a gift, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gift, but it's also a lifestyle. And I think that people have to determine in short order here, early in your life, what type of lifestyle do you want to live? Doesn't mean you can't have your fun. D trust me, I'll be the first person to say, I love to grab a tequila, sit with the boys, have 1942, fun. 1942, baby, Listen, let's go. I've been to my share of Clizzies, the Cliz Up. Don't mind going to the Cliz Up <laughs> once in a while in my career, I'll tell you that. Love to mix. have my fun. But, uh, you know, I never sacrificed that for my responsibility, not to the New Jersey Devils, not to the NHL, not, no, but to myself and my family first. Like that's the responsibility is to myself to say, I am going to get better today because I want to get better because I, I want to see myself get better and I want to do it because I respect myself. I respect my family. So that's where everything comes from for me. So we, we've talked a lot about, you know, what's going on in your career. Um, you know, some of the, the, you know, your favorite past uh, highlights, but when you think of, changing the game when, when you're a dreamer, the way you are, uh, what is next for PK Subban? Like, what are you really looking forward to in your life here? Um, still haven't won a Stanley cup. Let's do it, yeah. man. Let's do it with Jersey. 
uh, you know, you got the production company. Um, I'm sure you're uh, trying to find a way to make more money, to give away more money. You know, um, what's what's on your agenda for for what's next in your life? Well, I'm going to quote Big Carl. Um, there was one game I go back to, I played in Montreal. I might've been 24 at the time and I was sick. I had the flu, like really, really bad. And I think this was the year after I won the Norris and the LA Kings just came off winning a Stanley cup. They were on a tear and they were coming into Montreal and, you know, Drew Doughty, also one of the top defensemen in the league, a guy that I've competed against my whole career. I got a lot of respect for. And very similar to like what Kobe said to Vince, like, you know, whenever I have other players that are good players at their position, you know, players that I've competed with, competed against, that I know compete against me, I, I never bow out to anybody. I've never dodged anybody. I've taken it face on. I'd fight and clawed for everything. And I remember at that moment in time, it had nothing to do with Drew or anybody like that. It had to do with the fact that the Stanley Cup champions were coming in. I was the highest paid player on my team. And even though I had the flu, you know, I knew that my team was like, they were going to judge me based on that. Like no one get, no one cares about whether you got the flu or not. This is a Stanley Cup team coming in. Are you like, you know, if you can play, we want you on the ice. Like if you can walk, if you can stand, we want you on the ice. And I remember I, I stayed at home for like two days. Game day came. I didn't do pregame skate. And I went to the rink and I, I talked to my dad. I'm like, like, I honestly, this is probably the worst I've ever felt. But I said, you know, I always seem to play my best games whenever I'm sick. And I'll, the reason why is because when I was younger, I, you know, I had a tendency to be so energetic all the time. And when I was sick, I knew that I wasn't at 100 percent. So I had to go into my mind and think the game the best. And I, I, I think that's one area I don't get a lot of credit for is how I think the game. And this game, we happened to come out. I ended up being a four point night for me. I had a goal and three assists. We beat them. I think it was seven, four. And after the game, I called my dad and I was excited. I'm like, dad, man, I had a game today. Like, you know, I was sick. I, I battled through it. And he goes, well, whether you were sick or not, I'll tell you this. You've had some, you've had some great years so far in your career and some great games, but I still don't think that you've had your best shift yet, your best period yet, your best game yet, or your best season yet. And that's the way I always look at it. Being 31, I still don't think I've had my best shift. Still don't think I've had my best period. Still don't think I've had my best game. And I definitely don't think I've had my best season. So that's my preparation. That's my mindset for it. And, you know, on the hockey side, my goal is to, to become the best, keep continuing to build and become the best version of myself and to be a great teammate, continue to be a great teammate. But obviously to reach my final goal and that's winning a Stanley cup. I, that's my goal. And, you know, I, I, I don't expect it to come easy. So it's not going to be easy for me. Clearly there's been other things that have come easier for me, but this is going to be a tough thing to achieve. And that's what makes it so special. And, um, you know, the work that I'm going to do from here on in is, is going to be what I'm going to be able to live with. I can live with myself to, to this point today. I want to make sure that when my career is over, that I can say I gave everything I possibly could to maximize my potential as a player. Uh, as far as the production stuff goes and all that stuff, you know, that's really a way for me to balance my life out. You know, mm -hmm. I think that hockey has taken so much of my time and rightfully so. And I love the game, but I'm also a person too. And I have other interests and, you know, I, I, I can't train 24 hours a day. Right. It's just not healthy. It's, uh, you know, I have other things in my life that when a lot of guys are going golfing or playing video games, I'm doing stuff for my production company. I'm yeah, doing definitely things in golf. And I've seen, I saw it on your Instagram the other day. You, you, good I, for you. Listen, you suck. I've golfed. That was the, <laughs> see, that was the second time I've golfed in a year. I got a so, carve you. Okay. And but I'm that's still the hitting point, 350. Right? I'm still hitting them 350. Sacrifice, oh, three, 350 feet. I'm, I'm hitting them 350, <laughs> but. It, it takes me about nine chips just to get it on the green. So it doesn't even matter. But, but um, no, you asked me about the production company and stuff. Um, 
got. A, I actually have a lot of projects in the works. Um, a lot of them have to do with telling the story. First of all, the production, the name of my production company is Ugly Duck, and I do have some projects I'm working on now. Um, you know, a couple of things that I can talk about and things that I want to kind of let come to fruition. Um, there may be a, a podcast that I may be. Uh, coming up with. So C's, you might have some competition. It's okay. I expect yeah, you to come on. No problem. No problem. I'll take you and no problem. Bring the yeah. best out of it. So I do have a, a podcast um, that I'm working on kind of to try to get going here shortly, hopefully in conjunction with, con con conjunction with the hockey season. So I'm hoping to do that. And then on the production side, there's, I got about six or seven projects that I'm working on right now. Hopefully that um, you know, kind of come through fruition. Obviously with COVID and everything going on has made a, it a lot tougher um, to have meetings and to really even get any production done. So, but uh, the production company is looking great. Charity stuff is looking great. I have my hockey school next week. It's the first hockey school that I've ever done virtually. So I spent about 10 hours doing drills in my garage for these kids and prepping that. So I'm hoping the kids will be awesome. really, really excited with all that stuff, all the proceeds going to charity. So thank you to Adidas and Cliff Bar for stepping up and sponsoring kids as well as sponsoring the hockey school. And uh, yeah, man, I'm just, you know, listen, we got about what, five months season until the season. Yep. So that's pretty much what I got going on right now. That's awesome. L last, uh, We'll wrap it up here soon. I had a cool story to tell you. I don't know if you know this about uh, Lindsay. So your fiance, Lindsay Vaughn's obviously a badass. Um, you know, her career, so much adversity. Absolute smoke. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, one of us can say that. That just get <laughs> out of hand. But uh, so I, I had this injury this year, you know, where I, I broke my finger. And I'm, you know, she's asking me about it. I'm walking out of one of the, it's after one of the games. I'm still out. And she's asking me about it. And I'm like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm bummed about it. it kind of sucks. Weird, weird injury happened in practice. I'll be fine. But you know, it's getting back. And, uh, she just looked me dead in the eye and goes, you know, I know it sucks, but you're still in the fight. And there was a, a, anytime you get to talk to any athlete, right? We all die. Athletes die twice. You talk about the, the special short window that is our career. Um, Lindsay's on the other side of that now. What's it like having someone like her around someone who's been through her own career of different and that it's individual, which I think has some cool nooks and crannies to an individual sport like skiing. Um, but there's gotta be no excuses in that house with, with what she's been through. Lindsay's a special individual, right? Obviously, you know, I love her dearly and she's, she's my fiance and she's the person that I look to build the rest of my life with. But let's park all that for a second and talk about who she is as an athlete and a person because her saying that to you was her understanding that like, listen, I know, you know that I've gone through some stuff. I know that you know that I've competed on the highest level, but I don't have to talk about that. All I got to let you know is that you're still in the fight. And that's a vote of confidence for you to continue to work on what you can work on, stay the course and manage it. Because I, what she's gone through, I don't wish for anybody to really go through yeah. because there's no telling that you're going to have the success at the end of the, at the, at the end of the road. She's managed to go through all that and find a way to come up on top, blowing your knee out, you know, Blowing your knee out, having to do a year rehab, blowing it out again, doing another year rehab, blowing up the other one, doing another year. Re like, it's just, it doesn't even make sense, right? The mental, like the wear and tear on your mind that that, that brings you. She's an absolute monster. So you're, you're exactly right. It's not about whether she's complaining. I got no margin. I got no Nothing. area to, what am I going to complain about? Like, come, I come to the ring, talk anything. to me. Come talk well, that's to what me. I mean. <laughs> well, I can tell you this, you know, it's first of all, she's she's great um, as a partner because she understands the commitment that I have to make to my craft to do what I want to do and not to maintain, but even strive for for greater. Right. She knows that I'm going to look for every opportunity to push it. And she supports me in that regard. You know, the one thing I had to get used to is 
not really being the smartest person in the room from knowing exactly everything that I have to do. Like now I actually have somebody that I can actually trust who's with me every day to ask questions to like, you know, I've always lived on my own seas. I've been single pretty much my whole life. I've never. So to have somebody that has, I mean, she got way more trophies than, than I'll ever probably have. Right. I got a lot of trophies, but she got a ton of trophies. So she's been there and her sports extreme. So, you know, on the mental side of it, she gets it. She understands it. So when it comes to me getting up every morning and working out and doing it, she's at a different part in a, you know, stage in her life right now. But when I'm finished training and the under and her understanding on how to offload me so that my brain can recover and get ready to do it again, to put my body and push my body again, like that's where I see it from, from her. But the one thing I'll tell you with Lindsay, and I'm going to tell you one quick story about her. I remember when Lindsay had a tibia plateau fracture and a torn LCL. And I was playing in Nashville and she called me on the phone. She's bawling her eyes out. She's crying. She's like, I'm done. It's her last year skiing. Uh, you know, I don't know. I could be done. I'm just like, listen, she's like, I'm just in one right now. This sucks. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to have to get through this. I'm going to have to try. And I'm like, okay. And like I said, sees, I've always lived on my own, right? I've always, she's like, would you be open to me and my team coming to Nashville to do my rehab? And of course I'm like, are you kidding me? Cause I didn't plan on seeing her for like six more months. I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, sure. I'd love for you to come back. Right. So she comes back, her whole team's there. This injury was like, I think it was supposed to be like six to eight weeks. Dude, I watch Lindsay every day, get up 5 a.m., treatment, train, treatment, train, pool, treatment, like, like clockwork, okay? Like a grind, grind. She was back in three weeks, huh. three weeks, half, not like less than half of the time back on the mountain skiing. Like I watched her do it every day, day in, day out, just watched her do it. And when I tell you like she used every second of every day to get back there, she used every second of every day to get back there. She did not, it was throttled down. That's who Lindsay is. She's throttled down. I'm fired She's up. throttled down. There's no other, like, I can't explain it any other way. That's just You're who gonna she is. You're going to have me doing hill sprints on a Sunday now after listening to this shit. No, but I'm, I'm telling you. Outside. She's throttled down. It's just throttled down the whole way. So it's like, for me. So cool. It's not that it's like, it's not that I'm not throttled down. I am throttled down, but it's cool to be with somebody who who does the same thing, yeah. who has done it at the highest level is what, like, it's just, it's pretty awesome to be around that every day, you know? No, that's, uh, and I, and I know, you know, record on a Sunday morning. Uh, thanks man for coming on. Um, I look forward to hopefully chopping up with, with Lindsay at some point when she's game, yes. I know you guys are both jamming, uh, Subi and, and, we didn't even get into a little bit of the, the teammate you are. I got pictures on my Instagram. No one's smiling bigger when I score than you. Um, you know, support me. You know, I know you're busy as hell uh, by coming on here, man. Have a great rest of your day. I know you're with, you know, LV the rest of the day. So get some, get some pancakes in here or something that it's Sunday. Have a, have a good rest of your day, man. But um, this was fun. And, and I, I look forward to doing it in person when, we, when we're. Dude, one, 100%. Eight months from now when we're back in the mix. 100%. And I ain't pumping your tire. I know, you know, I love you. You know that, you know, I respect you so much and I love you first of all, as a person and as a teammate, but I like, I don't say this lightly, you know, I've seen a lot of people do podcasts. I really respect what you're doing. It's That's a difficult great. thing to do. And I respect you twice as much of when you started it because it's not easy to do that, you know? And I think that I'd like to see a lot more guys in our game step out 
a lot more guys in our game step out and show this comfort in being able to talk about things that they want to share with their fans and with our fan base. We need more of it in the game. So keep it up. I'm happy to be a part of it and uh, would love to come back on. But definitely when I get my podcast going, we're going to get something going. All right. 100%. Last thing, Sue, where can people find you uh, to donate to the charities you're involved with? Find you on Instagram. I know you're in the mix there. YouTube. Yeah. So, you know, I, my YouTube channel, like, and subscribe, uh, go on. We do a lot of stuff for my charity there. Uh, usually when I have my YouTube, um, channel, whenever we drop something on my channel, there's a donate button, uh, right under the like and subscribe. So, um, check that out. Also, you can go to pksuban.com. Um, you can visit PK Subban foundation, my Instagram account, Follow me, Subinator on Instagram, PK Subban one on Twitter. I mean, follow me wherever you want. What's up, kid? I talk a sub kid. I talk a lot about my charity, and it's obviously priority number one for me. You know what I mean? With ten million dollars, you know, we're we're almost at our point now, and we continue to move it forward. Next week, we have um, my hockey school that we're doing virtually. So check that out. We're gonna have some stuff on my YouTube channel. We'll be streaming live every day. So. Uh, for fans that want to get in the mix, follow. Like I said, get on my YouTube channel, like and subscribe. Love you guys. Cease, thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate Absolutely, it. Absolutely, brother. Have a great rest of your day, man. First off, thank you to all of our listeners for listening today, wherever you are in the world. Please continue to like, uh, subscribe, share. Uh, and thank you to our guest, PK Subban, top of the line energy. That's probably the number one. Uh, review point that I want to talk about today. Nothing happens without enthusiasm. And PK is one of the most energetic leaders I've ever played with. And I think that his energy is a choice. He purposely facilitates uh, a higher state of being day in, day out. And given the grueling physical and mental nature of the NHL, given the fact he's been there for a long time, it's impressive day in, day out. Second point I want to review today is... I'm so proud of PK's self-knowing. He, he's got this inner knowing and, and trust with himself that he's put the work in. We talk a little bit about performance anxiety, uh, nervousness around you know, high-end performance, and PK has played on the world's you know, biggest and brightest stages uh, for a long time now. And he discusses how doubt from others will always follow you, but he's just he's got a knack for not internalizing it. He's not uh, really welcoming of other people's viewpoint or the, the pressure they want to put on him. PK is very much a self-starter that way. And then one of the other things I think is admirable about PK is while he admits that, you know, the, the production company, the social media side is something that's an outlet for his, uh, you know, high level of energy. Uh, it helps balance his life out. He does not negotiate with what it takes to be his best. It takes what it takes. Uh, I remember listening to a clip on YouTube. I think it was Nick Saban. Uh, discussing this from the University of Alabama, where he was trying to explain to one of his college football players that there's no negotiating with what it takes to be your best. And PK embodies that and and lives very in alignment that way. Uh, so finally, you know, thank you to PK for all your time. Thank you to our guest uh, for joining us today. I look forward to next week as we both continue on our journey to become a more curious competitor. Thank you.